This is Vaughan at Westcote Bell Pottery in La Haye, Nova Scotia, and I've had some questions about kiln firing, this firing in particular, so I figured I should do a quick video add-on um, about doing a bisque firing. Uh, it's the simplest of all the firings, basically, but you have to know what you're doing. Um, the most important thing is you do not want to have anything wet, or even a hint of wet, going into the kiln for a bisque firing and just firing it up because it will explode. And let me show you this difference. I have all my pieces. To, I am lucky enough to have more than one kiln. So this kiln is firing. It's, actually, it's cooling down. Uh, but it, I use the heat from that lid to actually dry all my pieces out. And there's a danger here, too, that you don't want to put something wet on there because it will crack it. Uh, too, if you dry things too quickly, they will crack. So I have damp cupboards, and you can see in my studio tour that I have damp cupboards to keep my uh, pieces in so the drying is controlled. Um, drafts will warp pieces, too fast the drying will crack off handles and uh, any little add-ons, because things have to dry evenly on a piece, otherwise the shrinkage gets stressful. Uh, so you really have to make sure the pieces dry sort of slowly over a period of three to five days uh, in a cupboard um, or somewhere without drafts, or lightly draped plastic over them. But anyway, these mugs are dry. Nope, that one's not quite dry because they've been on the kiln a while. Let's see if I can find one that's fairly dry. Um, no, nope, that's not. Maybe I can find a planter. Okay, not sure if you're going to be able to see this or not, but this piece on this mug is actually still damp. It feels pretty dry, but you can see it's a slightly darker color. Than the other one this is dry and this one is still damp so even this one will explode if you fire it in the kiln right now so what i do is i put them on here for a period of time until they're completely dry uh, and then i will put them in the kiln and i'll still do a preheat to actually make sure that the actual pieces are bone dry. Um, and, um, and that's the most important part of doing a bisque firing, making sure that the pieces are thoroughly dry before you take them over 212 Fahrenheit or 100 degrees centigrade. Because as soon as you get over that temperature, water turns to steam. And you know what a steam engine did from the Nukeman engine and when they invented steam engines? It is, it's a very powerful expansion from water to steam and it blows the pots up. So that's the first thing. Okay. The next thing is have an assortment of pieces. You know, don't just you know have big pieces um, because they will take up a lot of space. So you need small things to go in your crevices. You can pack things on top of each other, inside each other, and, and they can touch because there's no glaze involved in this firing. So you can actually squeeze as much into that kiln as possible and everybody is very conscious of energy these days, but it isn't just about space, it's about you know the weight of the pieces. Um, so if you've got mass, it takes a lot more energy to heat up uh, a large mass than it does a small mass. So it's not just about the actual volume of the pieces, it's more about the actual weight of clay that you've got inside the kiln with the shelves and the props to hold the shelves up. Um, but you'd still try and be efficient and, and cram as much into this type of firing as you can because they can touch, they can be inside each other and everything. So that's the second thing that I think is really important. <coughs> um, so it's a variety of pieces, not all my pieces are here. Um, and also I've looked, thought over time that the shapes of pieces, things that I could have a ball sticking like this with this piece going down and coming up over there. So I could get one of these and another one like it next to that ball going underneath the wall of the ball so it actually uh, it makes it more efficient to cram a lot of pieces in if you've got an assortment of pieces. Do I have a bowl here? Um, this one kind of does what I'm saying. So I can have this next to it and it, it overlaps the foot of this piece a little bit, but a, a wider bowl would have been a better example. But you can actually see that you can get pieces that um, will overlap at each other in the kiln and that saves space as well. That the most important thing, I guess, is if you've got wide pieces, is to have a whole bunch of short pieces that can fit underneath. And when you're firing the kiln, 
If you put all your mugs like this next to each other, the width of the bottom determines how many pieces you can get on that shelf. But if you simply flip this mug upside down and have it all fired on its rim, then you can get two pieces you know, touching each other in the fire and really cram the things much tighter that way because they actually, you know, it's, it's like a jigsaw puzzle at that point. Um, so that's a nice trick as well. But it's really nice when you can get something like a mug inside a flower pot, which I've got here. So these will fire inside the actual flower pot. I can show you this. Things don't warp in bisque firing, so it's easy to make sure I don't rattle it too much. You can see I can fire a mug inside that flower pot. I could be nice if I've got another flower pot, I can fire inside this one and then a mug inside that one. So we can get three things on top of each other as well. So that will save you a lot of space and fire a lot more pieces in bisque firing. Okay, three balls inside each other. These are little flower pot bases. But if there is a little looseness I would say you can fire them inside each other because they wobble around a little bit. Let's tip that down a bit. So these wobble around a little bit. So that's quite okay to fire because they will shrink in the firing and I always kind of think, well, you know, they all shrink the same rate, but that's not always the case. Um, so uh, you can fire three like that inside each other and then I can pack, let's take this off, it might be getting hot now because they're on the kill. These can go, well, no, it wouldn't save much space. I'm saving maybe half an inch to an inch by firing these next to each other, but you can sit, get the idea. But this would be a very wasteful way of doing it because they're so much shorter. So I'll try and put all of these on a shelf where they're all the same height because that really is important that everything in this firing is kind of that height on that shelf. And these flower pots can be fired upside down just like the mugs can be fired upside down. So you can get two flower pots next to each other, much closer together, and all that, and that saves space as well.
Okay, so you just saw me pack the kiln. I'll put this a little bit in. I hope that was speeded up a bit because it took a while. You can see that I've got all the pots in there, like I just described. Uh, and I've left a gap of about three quarters of an inch to an inch around the pots to the elements. So I don't want to get too close to the elements because you can crack your pots that way as well because they heat up too quickly. Um, so keep a little gap between your elements and the pots. But you can see I've crammed everything into that space and I've put a stick across the top of two of the props just to make sure that nothing is too tall. So it's a good idea to get yourself a stick that you can fit in the kiln and just do that to actually show that, and look alongside and make sure none of the pots are too tall for the actual props because that's a very common mistake and you can crack and actually have a, a serious kiln disaster if the a shelf collapses down on, on that pot and then makes a bump, it might crack more than one piece. Um, so just make sure that nothing's too tall for the props. All right, so we know that everything's the right height. Whatever shelves you have, um, shelves tend to get stuck to kiln props a little bit. Uh, and you can see the debris. Every so often you should sand these at the bottom of the shelves just to make sure nothing's on there making your shelf uneven. Okay, so I just sanded and ground any lumps off the bottom of this kiln shelf so that it's smooth again because the props tend to stick little bits. I bat wash some of my props and basically they can leave bat wash on the shelf. So that's what those marks are. These are the advancer shelves. The other side, I've actually bat washed. Make sure there's nothing sharp on them because usually things just slip right off these type of shelves. Um, and otherwise, if you have the old style shelves, and glaze bits stick on the shelf, you can cut your hand seriously on those shelves. So be very careful. Uh, if you have a glaze run and it sticks to the shelf, it'll probably crack your pot. Um, and when you chisel it off, you'll leave sharp bits on here. So be very careful that you don't rub your hand across something because I've cut myself many times on those old shelves. These shelves are so great because nothing actually sticks to these. Um, you just lift it off and then you can lightly sand it with sandpaper and that takes care of it. So, um, so it's a good idea to use sandpaper. Um, but anyway, so just beware of the shelves after glaze firings, and then you just place the shelf down because we know it's the, the height of the props. And make sure it's even and it doesn't wobble. If you have new kiln furniture, it won't wobble, but older furniture like mine, um, sometimes it will wobble. So it should be stable. That's pretty good. I mean, I can force it to wobble, but it's not wobbling on its own. Okay. So then I'm going to put these in. Okay, so I have 3, 6, 9, 12, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21 balls on that shelf. Um, and there's another thing that you have to watch out for when you're packing your shelves. I'm not sure if you can see the pyrometer. Let's see if we can get over there. The, pyro the, the pyrometers are just here. And all the way down. This prop is going to correspond with that py that pyrometer there, thermocouple, not pyrometer, that thermocouple. So when I put the shelf on, it's going to touch that, and you must not touch that with your kiln shelf. So make sure when you put the kiln shelf on that you don't actually hit that, because they break. Um, and uh, you see, you've got to be very careful. If I can leave that there, I think you can see how. Um... So this shelf, I know they're the right height. I'm putting it down so it's close to the wall on the other side. Oh, it's just underneath anyway, so we didn't have to worry too much. Okay. My shelves are very thin. These are the Advancer shelves. They are very expensive, but they're worth it. Once you make some money from pottery, you should switch you over to these shelves. It's worth the investment, and they'll be tax deductible against your business anyway, for your profits and such and they save you money over time in heat and they also save you money in volume because they're shorter they're thinner so you get more pots in the kiln and pots never stick to them so you save the pot if it runs onto it you can sand it off it'll be fine you've saved a pot but anyway so you can see that that um, didn't touch the thermocouple uh, there's a little gap where i can put my finger not quite underneath it so i've got about a quarter inch um, a gap between the shelf and the thermocouple so be careful, thermocouples are not expensive, but, um, but you don't want to crack your thermocouple because you're firing, you'll need a thermocouple. So now I'm going to put my bird houses. 
feeders rather. It's spring, so I'll be making all the garden pots. Okay, that's my next layer up, um, and I've got bird feeders, planters, hanging planters there, and a hanging planter upside down here because it, it, it was get, get more pieces in by having it upside down. Um, and I put mugs, and there's one of the mugs upside down there, uh, so I can fit a, fit two mugs on the bottom and two mugs on the top there, and save space that way. Um, and then my kiln props I'm not sure about, so I'm going to put this across and just see whether I feel like it's too close. I can just do this. It's, it's very close. Let's try this way. Nope, it's good. So there's, there's a gap between that. So, um, so that kiln is good to go again. So let's make sure over here. I want to make sure this mug is not too tall either. Sometimes you just have to kind of fudge it a little bit, but yeah, it's just right. It's fine. Um, other one, I could put a shorter mug on there anyway. Let's see if this one's shorter than this one. Yes, it is, just a touch. So I can swap that mug around. Um, and uh, that's ready for the next shelf. And let's make sure we don't hit the pyrometer again. The thermocouple, sorry. The pyrometer is the thing that reads the temperature. This actually is the thermocouple, is the sensor. Okay, so then we have one last shelf to do. Okay, I have a lot of mugs in there. <clears throat> so three, six, eight, another six is 14, 19, 20, 22, 24, 25 and a ball. So could I get any more in there? So let's see. Okay, so I managed to get four more mugs in this kiln by turning some upside down and some the right way up. And that was, uh, you know, so that's four extra mugs. That's uh, whatever you sell them at, but that's gonna save you some money. Or does it? Because remember, firing isn't just the number of pieces you get in the kiln. It's the mass of the clay that you're firing that takes the, uh, you know, the heat that you're putting into the kiln to heat it up to the temperature. So I don't know if you win this way as far as cost in electricity, but I do know you win in the sense that you can get pots, more pots out of the kiln faster. Um, and uh, I have a rush order for 50 mugs on at the moment. So I'm trying to squeeze as many in as possible. Uh, and some of these weren't thoroughly dry. So that brings me to the next point. If you are in a rush and your pots are pretty dry, but you can still tell that there's a little moisture in them, usually in the thicker areas of the piece, you have to heat your kiln up at a certain rate so that it will actually not blow your pots up. So that's the next step. Okay, so I have, um, it's just, this is idle at the moment. I have a program in here that I use for that very process of drying things out. Enter program, user one, and I press enter. Segments one, I press enter. Ramp one will be like 50, 59, and I press enter. Degrees Fahrenheit, 189, remember 212 is boiling point, so 189 is hot enough so that it will force things to dry a bit faster, and I press enter, and then I hold it, depending on how much moisture is in there, one to three hours, so I'm going to put three, enter, and the alarm is the same, and that's complete, so now when I turn it on, it's going to fire at 59 degrees an hour, up to 189, so it'll take two hours of gentle heat to actually get the pots hot and then it's going to hold for three hours and during that three hours i will keep checking to see at what point the pieces are dry and how do i tell that well you close the lid you open your spy holes and if you have if it's winter it's easy you a cold mirror um, or a cold back of a spoon. You can keep it in your refrigerator, of course, as well. And you simply hold it. If you do this, hold it next to the top spy hole with a cold mirror. It will show moisture condensing on the spoon if there's any moisture in the clay in the kiln. Um, and if you show any moisture at all, you've got to keep it preheating. So you open the lid again and just let it preheat for a bit longer. So I would check that like after an hour 
and after two hours, but you've got to make sure that you close the lid just temporarily. Uh, you've got your spy holes all, all the way open, and so heat rises, it'll come out at this spy hole and just hold something cold like the back of a spoon or a mirror and see if there's any condensation. I'll check at one hour, I'll check at two hours, and if not, it'll go to the full three hours. But I never put, I never put wet things. It's only slightly damp, you know, like way past leather hard, uh, but slightly damp pieces in a kiln because if you rush dry something, it cracks and all that. So just don't do it. Uh, I just have this rush order for 50 coffee mugs. And so I'm really trying to get them ready for Monday. Uh, and this is Thursday. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, that's my bisque firing. Uh, and then of course, the programs in the kiln, you've got slow bisque and fast bisque. Um, for the actual pre-programmed ones in here. I always use slow bisque, it takes longer, but uh, I just feel firing slower is better. Uh, if you've got jewelry or something tiny, then you can use fast bisque. Um, and uh, if you don't have a computer kiln and you have a manual kiln, remember it's cone 06 for the bisque firing. Don't make the mistake of putting cone 6 in your little Dawson kiln sitter. Uh, and if you don't use one of those, you just use a thermocouple, um, a pyrometer thermocouple. You just have to take it up to about 1060 or 1025, 1060 for the bisque firing. Um, and uh, 1000 degrees is fine too. I mean, anything between 1000 and say 1060 centigrade. And if it's Fahrenheit, it's about 1840, I think, is the actual bisque temperature. Uh, so, and some people will bisque higher, but I found 06 temperature is fine for bisque firing, except for my earthenware, and that I actually bisque fired to cone 01, and then I glazed to 04. So that's a different thing. You'll see in my other videos why I do that. Uh, but anyway, so good luck with your first bisque firing, um, and uh, you know, just let you know if you have any questions and all that. And you could always call me if you had an emergency, whatever. But anyway. Thank you very much. All right, bye from Bourne, Nova Scotia.